did a two minutes of hand raise push ups, light touch, do our best to get as much as we can. The plates. Do this. Amen. I believe it's time to begin our Bible study. Amen. Tuesday. It's nice and uh, it's nice outside. It's nice and warm. But it's cool in here, which is amazing, which is awesome. Um, Reverend Liver Officer, we stand in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for taking us through this day. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to be in the house once again. Pray, Father God, and ask that you be amongst us. Lord, touch plants and help them to teach. Lord, help us to hear and to learn. Lord God, and help us to continue, Lord, to strive to learn more and more of your words. Lord, we give you all the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, if y'all remember anything from last week, uh, we talked about the ministry. We talked about the purpose for the ministry, the reason why God has placed the offices in the church, why and what specific offices there are, and all of these important things, important things, they really are. And um, I'm really enjoying going through this Bible study because a lot of things that we're learning, again, like I've mentioned previously, they're very basic, very generic, or not generic, but very elementary, that's a, that's a good word, almost like learning the basics again. Going back to elementary, learning the ABCs and simple addition and subtraction and all these things are stuff that we use throughout our everyday lives. Some use math in their everyday life more than others. And I found myself doing a lot more math nowadays. But thank God for calculators. <laughs> they keep us on track. But it's amazing how much of the simple things we use on a day-to-day -day basis that we learned in elementary school. So it's the same thing here as we're going through our studies and our teachings that these are things that we potentially could have learned early on in our Christian walk, or some people have not yet learned these things, which is why we are here. So it's been a blessing, and just studying about these, these first five have been awesome. Learning about the scriptures and the Godhead and salvation, really. You know, salvation is a concept that we hear about often, more often than not. But we, a lot of times we don't know what goes into the whole work of salvation. So that was an awesome study and learning about the church and the ministry. And tonight, we're going to dig into the Bible, learning about water baptism. Now, this is something that we believe that water baptism is by immersion which means to be fully submerged in water. And is a direct commandment of our Lord. The direct commandment of our Lord. This is something that we should believe. And it is for the believers. And again, I've read this verse over and over many times throughout this Bible study series. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing. Baptizing them how? There's a lot of different teachings and a lot of different places and people that believe certain ways to baptize. But here, our Lord and Savior commanded that, we, that the disciples baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 
That these are the things that were commanded of by our Savior. I got a phone call not too recently, maybe a few months ago, that a man was asking me, how do you baptize? Huh? That's an interesting question. So I began to talk to him and we, we, we had this conversation about baptizing and doing all of these different things. And then he started to started to try to nitpick and argue with me. I said, hold on now, hold on. Where, where, where are you going with this? Where are we going in this conversation? Oh, I'm just, um, I'm, what did he say? What did he say? Yeah, I, I ain't called to argue with you. I ain't called to argue with the old guy. He said, I'm 88 years old and I've been ministering for 50 years. Calling me, asking me questions and doing all of these things. But he said that if Christ commanded this, why then did the disciples say to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus? He was like, then I said, well, I don't know. You have to ask them. I don't necessarily know why they would say this thing. And so as I began to study it, we can see how uh, Peter began to express that in this belief, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and according to what he said here in Matthew 28, it all coincides. The Bible does not contradict itself. And then as we begin to learn and as we begin to study, we will see how things are open and expressed and also explained. So, and then we also believe that water baptism does not, it does not take away sins. The baptism of the water does not save a person, nor is it the same as being baptized or the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The two different, there are two different events. There are two different events, and we'll go through that. So this week we're learning about water baptism, and next week we'll learn about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So it'll be perfect. Two weeks that go almost together in tandem, that they work together. And it's, a, it's the walk of the, the Christian's life. You get saved, you get baptized, and you get filled with the Holy Ghost, or however that works. Salvation comes first. We know that. We know that. Yeah. That as we believe, and as we begin to study this, we can see that the New Testament Christianity is not a ritualistic religion. We don't go about holding different rites and ceremonies and doing all these things like other religions do. That, it, that at the heart of it, at the heart of this Christianity, we can see man's direct connection to God through his spirit. Through his spirit and through the belief in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That our relationship with God has everything to do with the relationships and the, the work of the other two parties of the Trinity. But there, however, however, there are two ceremonies or rites. It's a R-I-T-E, which is in definition a ceremony, which are essentially or essential to our belief. Because they were divinely ordained. They were divinely ordained. By who? By the apostles? By the, by the, by the Pope? By other, other men of history? No. They were ordained by the Lord Himself. Those two, what are the two? Do we know? Anybody? Sister Marcel, do you know? Reverend Leverock, the two ceremonies that we hold that were ordained by the Lord. All right, time's up. It's the, the, the baptism of water, water baptism, and the Lord's Supper. These two things that we do. Now we can know and understand that the first one, the first one we do almost at the start of our Christianity, right at the beginning. Because what it does is it shows. It shows and it makes clear and evident the relationship that we now have with Christ. 
that the water baptism is an outward show of what happened on the inside. Mm -hmm. And then the second one, the Lord's Supper, is something that we can do as often as we wish. He said, as often as you do, you can do it every day, you can do it every other day, once a year, once a week. However, however you do it. How often you do it, it doesn't. Hello, sir. Welcome. Right now we're getting into talking about water baptism and how important it is. And kind of the origin of it all and where it began. Um, water baptism came and was first directed there by Christ in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. But that wasn't the first time we've seen it or heard of it. Because we know that John Baptist went around baptizing. We know that John did a lot of this stuff as well. Because even we, as we read in the book of Acts, Paul began to talk to these people and say, well, have you been baptized since you believe? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He said, we well, didn't even know if there was any Holy Ghost. That's in Acts chapter 19. He said, then whose baptism were you baptized with? He said, we were baptized under the baptism of John. That's the, the, baptism, the baptism of water. So then he begins to explain to them, all right, well, here's the next stage of your, your, your walk with God. So, yes, the first picture of this water baptism is faith in Christ. Faith in Christ, that's the water baptism and this, like I just mentioned right before you got here, that, that it's an outward show of what happened on the inside. And we're saved and we're sanctified and we're cleansed on the inward man. And we show the world by this immersion in water baptism that we are Christ's. And obviously the second one, which is the Lord's Supper, it shows the fellowship that we have with Christ. It shows the fellowship that we have in Him. So this mode, the mode of it all, this word baptism, Used in the formula means to dip or to immerse, which we believe that you should be fully submerged in water. And we'll get into that as we look into the scriptures there in Romans chapter 6. This interpretation is confirmed by Greek scholars and even church historians. Even scholars belonging to churches which baptized by sprinkling admit that immersion was the earliest mode. <clears throat> and you ask why? Well, how did, they get, how did they get away from fully immersing to just sprinkling? So they got away from it when the church forsook the simplicity of the New Testament. It became influenced by pagan ideas. It attached to an unscriptural importance to this water baptism, excuse me, which came to be considered fully essential to regeneration or to be being regenerated. So how what, what would happen is that this water baptism that they were performing, they would do it for the sick and for the dying people. Well, obviously, somebody that's in the hospital laid up in the bed, you're not just going to take them, all right, and dump them into a, a pool of water. Because maybe it wasn't uh, able at the time. Maybe there was different things that weren't available for them. So they, they got to the simple thing of, we're going to baptize you, but since you can't go anywhere, we'll just sprinkle you with water. So later, because of convenience of the method, because it was so convenient, they just made it a general thing. Just sprinkle you a little bit. And you can see it even now today. That people think that baptism is just a light sprinkling of water. No. No. Because again, uh, let, let's, let's turn to it. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, beginning to read in verse 1. Romans chapter 6. I love Romans. I love Romans. My goodness. There's so much information in there. So 
But right there, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's a big old no. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? It's a good question, right? It's a good question. He says, know ye not? Or basically he was saying, don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Uh, let me read that as it's, as it's with the... With the Punctuation mark. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? It's a question. Don't you know this? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death. That, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Again, this is what he was saying, that we are baptized into Christ. So here goes the example, that just like Christ was, was killed, he died and buried, <coughs> covered with the earth, entombed. Then he rose again. Then he rose again from the dead by the glory of the Father. It's the same thing with us, that we are showing ourselves to die to this world, just as Christ did for our sins. I like it how they put it here. It says, the lowering of the convert pictures Christ's death accomplished, as somebody's lowered into the water. The submersion is the convert's of the convert speaks of his burial. So the rising signifies death being conquered, or this, the resurrection of Christ. That Christ died for sins in order that this man might die to sin. And also, Christ rose from the dead in order that this man or woman might live in newness of life or in a new life of righteousness. That it, it, it's not going to save us, per se, but it's showing us, us dead to sin and raising again new, just like it had for Christ. It's the same thing. That it's a picture of what Christ went through. And also there, if you turn to Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Uh, verse 38. Let me see if that's the right. Put that in there correctly. So even there, as, as Peter began to speak unto them, he says, repent. Repent. So that, that's where we can, we can say for surety that water baptism does not save. Because it was right here that he was telling them, here, repent first. Get your spiritual body and your spiritual man cleansed and clean. And then, and then, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's what, that's what he was saying. But here, this is they, people take this verse of Scripture, and like I mentioned at the beginning, they, they use it as a stepping stone to say that you only have to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. When, when Christ said himself, to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So those, those four, the, the words that came after do not represent a baptismal formula, the formula, but were simply a statement that such persons were baptized as acknowledging Christ. 
that they acknowledged Christ to be Lord and Savior. And you can even see it in some of the older, the, the material that was written after the Bible, after the Bible, it speaks of this water baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. We get that. But when you start to describe this ceremony and look things up and further explain it, we can see how it goes back to a Trinitarian formula. How it goes back to represent both, not both, excuse me, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Because that's the formula that Christ had laid out for us. That in this understanding and this belief, being baptized in these names here, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, we now can, we're testifying that I have spiritual communion with all three. I have spiritual communion with God, and even Paul, as he was writing this conclusion there, 2 Corinthians 13, he said, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost is with you. But, but, we have to realize and understand that there are a lot of people that do not believe. They do not believe in the Trinity. They believe that God is one being, one person, and He did everything Himself, which we know He did, but there's those three that make up one. As we look at that, as we looked at the triangle, that spiritual triangle there in week two, or week three of it, we began to go in talking about the Godhead and the Trinity. That it, it comes from that, and now we are acknowledging them. We have communion with all three of them. That's important. <laughs> that is really, really important. That's the formula. Now you say, well, who are the recipients? Who can be baptized? Well, essentially anyone can be baptized. But to do it in the right way, making sure that it's, it's being done properly, it's those that have professed and confessed their faith in Jesus Christ. It really it says, all who sincerely repent of their sins and exercise, I'm glad it didn't stop there, and exercise a living faith in the Lord Jesus are eligible for baptism. So there again here, we can read of an instance in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, let's turn there and we'll kind of go through this story here. Any other time, 30 minutes seems like a very, very long time. <laughs> Any other time. But when you're teaching, it just goes by. It just goes by. It's already been 22 minutes. Hello. I know. Tell me about it. Acts chapter 8. Right there in 35, well, the story goes up even further up in, uh, toward the beginning of chapter 8. starts at verse 29. But we're going to skip that and go all the way down to verse 38. Uh, 35, excuse me. 835. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now listen to what Philip said to him in verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then he commanded that the chariot stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, 
And he went on his way rejoicing. There has to be a change on the inside before you can show people that there's a change on the outside. So then again it goes that anyone can come, but they have to have faith in the work of Christ, repent of their sins and believe, literally being saved. Then the water baptism is a show of what happened on the inside. Then it also comes by prayer. It also comes by prayer. Acts 22, 16, he says, And now, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Then we can see that there's a vow of consecration. There's a vow to be consecrated or to be put into a place to where we are working for Christ. A vow. I have confessed my sins before the Lord, and I'm making a vow to now be His forever. Not to pray for salvation and then go out and commit all of these sins. Not to be baptized to show everybody, oh, look what I've done. Just to go out again, running back into the same things. They go again and they call it that washing of regeneration. So you're almost, as if, it's as if you're taking a, a spiritual bath when you are washed on the inside and regenerated. Mm. And again, you're showing people what happened to you on the inside. So a lot, I know a lot of people believe in infant baptism. They take the infants and they dedicate them to God and they do in all of these things. But what does it help them? They haven't changed on the inside. They haven't repented and confessed. Now they're newborn, so they have not necessarily committed a sin. But again, like the psalmist said, we were all shaken in iniquity. We're all in need of a Savior. So we just kind of wait until they come to an age of understanding. So they can know what's going on and, and have this understanding and idea of why it's being done, being done and taking place. Mm -hmm. Not to say that kids can't come to Christ. Because that's what Christ said in, in Matthew 19. He said, bring the little children unto me. Bring them unto me. I'm not saying that I will not do a water baptism for a child. But it's for, you can liken it as children in God. Children in Christ. That as a new believer, as a babe in Christ, yes, that's what it's for. To show people. But a lot of people have a lot of different ideas and understandings of the, of the thing, of the thought. We've talked about regeneration. So that's what he was talking about. That word, it means like a washing or a literal bath. Titus, let's see. Oh, we're running out of time. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. We're going to do this. Verse 4, Titus chapter 3, verse 4. He said, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards men appeared. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So this washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost only takes place when Jesus Christ becomes our Savior. So he said it's by which shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So these things can only take place for those who confess their sins to God. Who ask Him to come in and be their personal Lord and Savior. That's when the washing 
and the regenerating and the renewing of all of these things can take place through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So if you've been saved and you haven't been baptized yet, let me know. Let's talk about it. I would like to do a, a, a water baptism soon, very soon. I want to. Um, I think it's something that's awesome. That it, it, it almost marks the, the journey of a new believer. Mm -hmm. Because when I got saved, I remember it had been a while before I got baptized, maybe two years. It's kind of a, not, not too long, it's not a long time. But it's like, it almost like it seals the deal. Really, it's like, man, all right. So now you just, it, it's an exciting time, and I think it's something that uh, everyone needs to experience. It needs to be done. So, if you need if you need it done, you need more understanding of it. We can go through the Bible some more and talk about it some more. But I would like to leave you with one last scripture, one last scripture that this water baptism helps us now to have a testimony for God. Galatians chapter three and verse twenty seven says, "For as many of you." as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. So we have been now baptized unto his death, raised again in newness of life. We are now putting Christ on as if we are putting on a new garment. Leaving all those filthy rags, as the Bible calls them, the sins of our past, our old nature, our old man, leaving them there at the altar. Leaving them there at the foot of the cross. And we're putting on Christ. Putting on a new nature and becoming new for Christ. It's amazing and it's awesome. The experience that Christ has for us. So this is something that should be done. And it will be done. It will be done. We're going to do it. We're going to find a place that will allow us to use their facility. Or find a nice... Nice pond somewhere. <laughs> We're going to make it happen. It's Kentucky and it's heating up, so it'll be warm outside. It won't be like going to Puget Sound in the summer. The Puget Sound is the, the waterway that connects Washington State, you know, portions of Washington to the ocean over there. It's super cold. In the summertime, it's like 60 degrees. You, still, you can catch hypothermia in the summer in Washington. Yeah, this is Kentucky, though. So we're going to get it together. My wife has already been looking and asking and talking to people. So this is something we want to do within the next month or two. So we'll let you know. If you're interested, we'd love for you to be a part. All right. That's it for tonight. Ah, two minutes over. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the teaching of your word. God, I pray that you allow this to find a resting place, Lord, allow people to have this understanding as you would have them to. Lord, allow us to continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of you so we can be better Christians for you. Brighter lights in this dark world. God, I pray that you continue to go with us and be with us as we go about our day. And bring us back at the appointed time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.